Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and I'm here today with Dr. Douglas Fry. He is Professor and Chair in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He has written extensively on aggression, conflict and conflict resolution in his books and in journals such as Science and American Anthropologist. His work frequently engages the debate surrounding the origins of war, arguing against claims that war or lethal aggression is rooted in human evolution. He is the author or editor of books like The Human Potential for Peace, Beyond War, War, Peace and Human Nature, and more recently, Nurturing Our Humanity. So, Douglas, thank you, uh, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, Ricardo, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Okay, it's my pleasure, no problem. So, let me first ask you, and this is a very interesting topic that you also asked me to talk about in our email exchange, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with the evolutionary basis of war and aggression and lethal conflict and things like that. Because, I mean, it seems to me that there has been a narrative, let's say, out there um, that comes from people like, for example, Steven Pinker and Lawrence Keeley, and I guess to a certain extent also Napoleon Shagnon, because he studied the Yanomamo, and we can talk about that a little bit later in the interview, um, that says that basically war uh, is part of human nature, war is, a, is part of our evolved repertoire, let's say, and that it was ubiquitous during our revolutionary history, that it was part of basically uh, virtually all human societies that have ever existed, even the more traditional ones like hunter-gatherers and horticulturalists. So, uh, what would be your first take on that? Well, you, you've actually uh, embedded many topics and questions into one. So, let, let's go to, I think, which is the primary idea here, is that, you know, what is human nature in relationship to war? Mm -hmm. Is there something innate in, in us that leads us to war, or, or is there not? And um, as, as you mentioned in the intro, I basically, my argument, my take on this is, no, there's, there's nothing in human nature that inclines us to war, per se. Um, you know, there's, there's elements of, of human nature that make war possible, obviously, because we do engage in warfare as we look through history and as we look through current um, events in the world. Obviously, humans are capable of war. But my perspective here is just that it's a very short-ranged and culturally um, limited type of perspective because there's just a whole variety of different types of evidence that argue against this perspective um, that you mentioned that war is really in human nature. So, for example, there are peaceful societies that are peaceful internally in terms of how they relate with each other and also non-warring societies. So this is one body of evidence. You, you can't make an argument uh, that's logical to say that humans have in their nature uh, to war and then there would be societies um, that contradict this by not engaging in war. So that's a pretty uh, clear logical fallacy, I think. Um, but that's just one type of consideration. You, you also mentioned nomadic foragers, hunter-gatherers, and this is a very important type of society to consider because humanity basically engaged in hunting and gathering across the broad um, span of our evolutionary history. And there's different types of evidence here. One, in, in fact, um, there would be literally nine reasons at least, which uh, Patrick Soderberry, my co-author, and I enumerated in a, an article in Science as to why we would not really expect there to be war among nomadic foragers. Uh, so, for example, the population uh, density for these groups is just so low, it's hard to get enough people together to have a war. But much more telling would be elements of their social organization. Uh, when you have nomadic foragers, the anthropologists who have studied these groups from around the world 
consistently point out how the membership in the bands is not stable. It's, it's not a group in the sense that we are used to thinking of a, a group that has continuation through time, but rather people come and, and join and leave and there's splinter uh, effects and regrouping and then sometimes the groups come together to form a, an aggregate for a short period of time. They celebrate, they feast, they renew friendships and trade and, and then they disperse again but in different patterns. So this type of idea that um, this social organization being inducive to war or inclined towards war doesn't make sense for a whole variety of reasons. And this is not just a theoretical argument, I, I should mention, but it's a data-based um, argument. When you look at the types of work that, that Patrick Sotaberry and I have done uh, with a systematic um, sampling of these nomadic foragers, um, and as well as the, the broad ethnographic database uh, that exists on these types of societies. But another you know, point that also, also comes up here, I'll just mention quickly, is what would they fight over? And um, the, the answer is you, you get some fighting amongst individuals. Most of the disputes in this type of society do not involve groups of people. They involve individuals uh, being jealous. Um, sexual jealousy is a big one. Um, or seeking some sort of revenge for a misdeed, or simply insults and grudges and this type of thing. So I've now mentioned you know, the fact that there are non-warring societies and talked a little bit about the nomadic foragers. Of course, we can come back to these topics. But a, a third um, very important line of evidence that argues against this idea that war is in human nature is archaeology. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... What we see there, there's, there's different elements of this. And the first one is much discussed and debated and haggled over. And that is that the, the earliest evidence for warfare archeologically anywhere on the planet uh, is 10,000 years ago or so, not older than that. So that the haggling comes in um, where some people who want to project war backwards say such things as, well, look at chimpanzees, uh, look at humans, chimpanzees sometimes raid neighboring chimpanzee groups and kill members of those groups. Uh, humans do the same thing, so therefore it must be in our genes to, to raid and war just like chimpanzees and push this back by, by reasoning, not by evidence, um, all, all the way to 5,000, oh, sorry, 5 million, 6 million years or so when there was a common ancestor between chimpanzees and, and humans. What is usually not considered uh, is the fact that an equally related species, the bonobos, formerly known as uh, pygmy chimpanzees, which um, people like Franz de Waal have written a great deal about, uh, they, they don't engage in lethal aggression or raiding. <coughs> so the, the, the argument there based on uh, a phylogic connection sort of has some problems to address. But let's go back to the archaeology for a, a minute here. So on the one hand, we have the actual physical evidence of warfare being limited in time going back. But um, the second line of evidence here that I find extremely telling and extremely important, and interestingly, it is basically ignored, just basically across the board ignored by people who are trying to make war go forever backwards, um, to use my colleague Brian Ferguson's term. And that is the sequences of the origins, plural, the origins of war that we can see archaeologically in different places across the globe at different times, but all within this 10,000 or so um, year range. So it's not just a mystery as to, well, we don't know when war originated. Actually, archaeology shows when war originates for particular areas on, on the planet. And you can look, for instance, at the Near East and see uh, a, a state of non-warring uh, and war starting to develop and ultimately you end up with a lot of warfare in the Near East. And this is all shown very well archaeologically. Or you can go to the southwest, sorry, well, yeah, the southwest of America, another example, and look at cases there and, and see when war came in. And I'm thinking, for example, of the Anasazi people that lived for hundreds of years in close contact with each other in this famous and very beautiful Chaco Canyon area of New Mexico. And when the climate shifted, these agriculturalists uh, went for another 50 years or so without engaging in warfare, but finally, um, due to ecological stress, it seems to be the most uh, likely explanation, war broke out and they had bloody, horrendous war, decapitations and 
all types of brutality. And this all shows up archaeologically. So, you know, one, one more example of this would be the Northwest Coast, which is where I was going to go initially. Different places on the Northwest Coast, you have political complexity coming in where nomadic foragers who were moving across the landscape and the seascape in some cases began to settle down. Their populations increased. Um, they had to use more intensive ways to harvest the, the marine resources there in this area of the country. And again, in different areas of the, of the Pacific Northwest Coast, you clearly see war coming in. And it doesn't matter if you're looking um, you know, to the, the northern part of the United States or up further to Kodiak Island, there's very good archaeology that shows a pattern of nomadic foragers uh, and no war, and then intensification, population increase, settling down, um, and developing of social hierarchies, and war comes in as part of this complex. So, so for me, um, you know, to, to summarize this succinctly, looking at the types of socialization, uh, the social changes, I should say, looking at the type of social organizations are just critically important. And when you have over millennia of our deep past, uh, people living as nomadic foragers, the whole setup is, is not conducive to war. And additionally, there's no evidence for war. But when you look within the last 10,000 years or so at different parts of the planet, you can actually see multiple origins of war in different places along similar types of patterns, which we could just dub a complexity uh, process or complexity pattern. Uh, and, and sometimes this has to do with uh, development of agriculture, and sometimes it has to do with exploiting uh, marine resources and other such resources more intensively and extensively. So that's uh, three lines of evidence here. Uh, and I, again, I just want to emphasize my take on this is very much evidence-based. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned in your original question, and and if you'd like to, you know, stop me at any point, please do or follow up or ask something. Sure. I, yeah, but you mentioned narrative, and that's a very very important concept I think that helps us make sense of what's going on in this topic of the uh, human nature, war and peace type of debate and discussion. And what many of my colleagues from different disciplines who just presume or assume or even explicitly make the argument that war goes forever backwards and has been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, it's a narrative from our Western civilization dating back at least as far as to the ancient Greeks and being manifested in different ways across Western, Western civilizations through these most recent couple of millennia. So what many scholars and scientists they don't do the self-reflection, which I would urge them to do, and think about where do they really get this idea that war, of course, there'd be war forever, go backwards, there'd be war in human nature and so forth. And how does that then um, be supported or not supported if you actually start looking at the archeology, span nomadic forager society, social organization, the development of complexity, uh, the fact that there are non-warring societies, uh, and a whole lot of other types of evidence here. So what we're basically, in, in my view, we, we have a shared dominant narrative that humans uh, basically are stemming from an original sin, including uh, engaging in warfare. And we have presumptions from Hollywood to magazines to university professors that of course this was the case. And you know, one thing, just, just to illustrate this with myself, uh, which was a you know a real learning uh, event for me. Back in the 1990s, I read an article by my colleague who I respect, uh, anthropologist Les Sponsel, and Les in his article uh, made the argument that well you know the oldest evidence for war is only 10,000 years ago, so most of the the deep past was non-warring, and at that time. So let me calculate, you know, about 25, 30 years ago. At, at that time, I just shook my head and I thought, oh man, Les, how could you say such a thing? That's, that's just so foolish. And it really took me a couple of weeks as, you know, not constantly, but as I just reflected on that um, point that, that Les had made in his article as I went about my life and, you know, went jogging, did my errands and so forth. And after about two weeks, suddenly I thought, new thought. But what, what if he's right? What if he could be right? And, and war is not really ancient, uh, like I've just presumed. 
And uh, that, that sort of, you know, was a, a key event in my thinking about this. And subsequently, in the last uh, 25 years or so, I've, I've really done a lot of research on this topic. And um, one, one thing that I do find, you know, a, a bit frustrating sometimes is when we have people who have not really looked at the data just making these assumptions. And, and this occurs all the time from people from different disciplines, whether they be, um, you know, psychologists or primatologists or philosophers or whomever, just starting with the base assumption, the base narrative that war is inherent in human nature, and then going back to construct arguments as to why this is the case. Well, that's, that's not science. Uh, I'm not sure quite what it is, but it's, it's not science. So we need to uh, formulate hypotheses. We need to look at the evidence, which is critical. And I would add, uh, to be a good scientist, you also want to be alert to your own assumptions and your presumptions and um, you know, question those as well as to why you're reaching the interpretations that you reach and, and why are you making the arguments that you make. There are several different points there that I could ask you follow-up questions about but uh, let's go for this now, because okay. uh, because one of the I guess that one of the main things that really influenced people at least recently over the last let's say eight or nine years or so about uh, and uh, I mean and basically it, uh, told them that we have been waging war against one another ever since Homo sapiens existed or something like that, is the, those archaeological sources that Steven Pinker refers to in his book, The, the Better Angels of Our Nature. And I guess that there are several problems with that. I, I, I can't remember now exactly um, how how old were the um, were those sources of evidence? So I'm not even sure if he was talking about uh, places where people found human remains that dated back to more than ten thousand years ago, or or not. I'm not sure about that. But it seems that even the ways by which he interpreted. Um, uh, for example, certain lesions, I guess, that people found in bones and things like that, uh, that it was, it was a bit misleading or something. Uh, I mean, could, could you tell us about that? I, I'm not sure uh, what were the problems there, but I think there, there were a few. Uh, yes, there certainly were problems with, with Peter, uh, sorry, with um, Steven Pinker's analysis of this and the arguments that he makes. And, and so uh, this is a, a wonderful follow-up to what I was saying in the sense of narratives or presumptions shaping where you go with things. Uh, clearly, Steven Pinker is starting with a presumption that there's something in humanity that leads us towards war. And um, basically, he's saying humans in a state of nature are inclined towards war. We always have been this way. We always will be this way with the caveat, then, of course, that when you have civilization coming in in the modern states, um, you can have a decrease of aggression. I notice that we've just slipped from war to aggression with that statement. So that's one one problem here we could talk about. But let me let me begin by um, saying a few you know data points that we're talking about. In Stephen Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature, in chapter two, and specifically in in a figure that's labeled Figure 2.2, are the archaeological data that you're referring to. And there's also data on nomadic foragers, supposedly nomadic foragers or nomadic hunter-gatherers, but there's a problem with, with that, that table as well. But in terms of the archaeology first from, from his, his table, it's not his data. He's uh, collected it from um, two other sources, a book by Lawrence Keeley, an archaeologist, and um, let's see, what's the, the other one? I believe it's Stephen Bowles, an article in Science. and. My colleague Brian Ferguson, who I mentioned earlier, has written really a damning critique of much of this archaeological data. So one point that, that Brian Ferguson points out is that you can't just take every evidence of a projectile point or some sort of lethal aggression and right away label it as warfare. Because of course there, there are homicides, uh, there's hunting accidents, 
So if you just have a single case or even several cases that are scattered across a, an area or across time, it's really fallacious to just assume that those deaths would have been due to warfare. So that's, that's one point that's um, very important here. Another one is that there are sampling issues with this list. I would say the very first one and the major one is it's not sampled from archaeological sites around the world. It's a cherry-picked list, or it's in fact when Pinker gets to it, you have a combination of two cherry-picked lists into this, this Pinker list. And so that's, that's a huge problem. And my colleagues, archaeologists, uh, Jonathan Haas and um, Michael, P uh, let's see, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Pisatelli, I think is close. Um, they did a real careful analysis looking at um, 4,000 some cases around the world, older than 10,000 years old. And they found a very, very low percentage of not just war, but any types of lethal aggression, I believe. Um, th there's this one site that's uh, quite extraordinary called Jebel Sahaba. But if I'm remembering my facts right, uh, there were only five other cases where there was more than one person injured uh, lethally. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not counting one person or more. Just There was a very, very small amount of lethal aggression across um, several thousand sites. So what this is telling us when you have a Pinker's List, that shows some sort of lethal aggression in every case but one. I want to come back to the one exception in a second. Compared to a very systematic and much huger sample from around the world that shows just a paucity, a paucity of lethal aggression that really suggests to me that something is, is really skewed in terms of the sampling. So that's an argument that Brian Ferguson has made and, and I've made as well with just the data that Pinker is using. Um, so it's, there's a, you know, next come in, a, you know, the definitional issues of what is war, what is homicide, that's important. The sampling is important. Um, but Brian Ferguson also points out this other issue is that you can eliminate seven of the um, actual cases. So there, he started with um, 21, if I have my math right here, eliminated seven and that left with, with 14 old cases of um of some sort of violent death. So whether that's war, we don't know, open question. But I looked at the list, I thought nicely in the list are dates. And virtually all of those dates are young. So remember we're talking about earliest evidence of war being around 10,000 years ago. In the list, one jumped out at me. It said 16,000 years ago. And I thought, what in the world is this? I've never heard of any violence like this. And uh, Niger, uh, 16,000 years ago, what's the rate? Zero. Hmm. So the oldest case in the list actually has no cases of lethal aggression. So, so, so the, the oldest case is 16,000 years old? Is that correct? Right? Correct. Okay. So, and, and the others are either, well, the, the, the others are, are younger than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had the table in front of me. I believe the next oldest was at 11,000. Again, is it war, is it not, what, what's going on there? Um, and, then, and then all the other ones are within this 10,000 years range. So you're not showing by this list of, of archeological examples of killing, whether it's homicide, accidents, um, feuding, outright war, what we would call war or what have you, w whatever it is, it's recent by this list as well. And of course, you know, just to, to add this and loop it back to the first question and discussion, there's nothing in this type of data that takes into consideration uh, what's going on in these societies. So that's uh, another irritant. But um, so, so I think hopefully your listeners are now getting the idea. There's not just one problem here. There's just a, a layering of issues from, from sampling to definitional issues to how old is this to then what sort of interpretation follows from looking at a list of 20 some archaeological cases that show some level of, of lethality and, and then interpreting that that therefore supports an argument that war is in human nature and goes forever backwards 
It just does not make a very sound uh, interpretation to go there. And of course, uh, that's that's where Peter P uh, keeps saying Peter Pinker, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where Peter Pinker um, takes it. Mm -hmm. uh, I interrupted you when you referred to the fact that the oldest case that he has there is from 16,000 years ago. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I don't have memorized the precise time periods, but isn't it the case that 16,000 years ago, if it wasn't already the Neolithic, then it, it was very close to what we call the Neolithic and the first agricultural societies? Yes, well, I mean, generally speaking, earliest evidence of, of agriculture comes in around 10,000 years ago, right? And then before that, sometimes uh, anthropologists and archaeologists talk about a, a pre-agricultural revolution, where some of the nomadic foragers started to settle down and intensify their productions in, in some places and so forth. So you see it there that in some places the beginning of social hierarchies, for example. You can see this archaeologically. So 16,000 years ago is not much older than where you see generally thought to be the first complexified foragers or complex um, hunter-gatherers coming in at the earliest. Many came in much later, you know, much more recently in time, just a few thousand years ago, again, depending on what part of the planet you're talking about. But if you look towards the Near East, where things tended to be early, uh, you, you get a change maybe at 13,000 years ago towards complexification, uh, pretty much at the earliest, then you, you get again more complexity, and you get agriculture coming in and so forth. So 16,000 years ago is pretty close to that. It's not so old. I think that's the key thing. We're not talking a million years ago. We're not talking two or three million years ago. We're talking 16,000 years ago. And then remember, that's the only case on the list where there's no evidence of, of violence, of lethal death. So in some way, that's exactly supporting my argument. And what I you know, point out, yeah, you don't have complexification. You have no evidence of war that old. Here again, you have no evidence of war that old <laughs> to cite. And, and, and it's it's even parents. more yeah it's even more interesting because since uh, uh, j let's just consider for a second that all the cases documented by Steven Pinker were really cases of war. If the oldest one is from sixteen thousand years ago, then I mean, couldn't it be the case then that, that even in that case, people could already live in a society that is. Uh, sufficiently different in terms of social organization from, for example, hunter-gatherers, for them to have uh, different social dynamics operating there and then to create conditions for more warring behavior, for example. Yes, and, and I mean, I don't think you're raising this point, but I'll just comment on it as well. I mean, there's nothing magical about 10,000 years ago we could tomorrow have a site that's 13,000 or 16,000 years ago that had warfare. But what I would predict, that site would show elements of complexification. In other words, it would probably be located on an aquatic um, type of subsistence base, which then allows for eating of fish and shellfish, um, you know, marine resources, ducks that might be there, et cetera, et cetera, seabirds, if it's on a, on a marine as opposed to a, a lake or a river. So, so you would find a certain subsistence base that allowed an intensification of the, using these animals, catching and, and eating these animals, which feeds back and forth to population increase, which leads to, well, we don't need to move anymore. We'll settle down and make permanent um, structures. So if you found me this case, you know, from 16,000 years ago, my prediction is it's going to be on a river on the, or on the sea, rich aquatic resources, there'll be settled people. We'll find evidence now of social hierarchy. And I'm not pulling this out of my head. I'm just applying what we've already learned about when you do see the origins of war, the type of um, preliminary conditions or necessary conditions that are there to be part of this complexity complex. So in the anthropology of war, do you already have well established any set of, let's say, ecological circumstances uh, that facilitate or predispose human societies toward war 
And I mean, in terms of ecological circumstances, do you also include there uh, things like, for example, uh, social circumstances, like, for example, social organization, the type uh, of um, the type of economy that they have, like, for example, if they are hunter-gatherers or if they are agriculturally, ba if they are an agriculturally based society and things like that. Yeah, there is an, if you, you know, try to step back from, from the, the type of societies and, you know, really take in the types of social organization that we see across humanity. There's a definite pattern and a sense of complexity in this way, too. So uh, sort of a, a rather simple but and to some degree accurate or reflecting reality is to think in terms of band level societies. These would be the nomadic forager bands. And then up the hierarchy, you can have tribes, which are a bit more complex, tend to settle down in some cases or be um, herders in another case. But they're based on a lineage system. And that's really important anthropologically, because all of a sudden you have subgroups, you know, socially marked subgroups within the society, which then can allow patterns of revenge to go back and forth. And you can get feuding in these types of societies much more easily than in the band level where they're not really differentiated this way. Then up the hierarchy, so to speak, you have chiefdoms and then finally states. And again, it's sort of a, a four part simple hierarchy of looking at societies, but the first two tend towards egalitarianism socially, with um, the bands being the best example of social equality and egalitarian ethos and so forth. And states, of course, are the most hierarchical. And whether we're talking about ancient states or modern states, they, they tend to be um, societies that have writing, uh, built temples, um, huge social hierarchies, special classes of individuals, whether they be you know, nobles and, and commoners, uh, etc. And sometimes even the, the the more archaic societies or kingdoms did have multiple layers. If I if I recall, um, the kingdom of Fiji had six different layers of classes, for example. Um, so when you get again, this is sort of the macro view on on human society. Um, the, there's been a really nice summary article, by the way, if anybody wants to, to track this down. It's a chapter in a book from 1995 by Stephen Reina, and and Reina discusses the types of aggression that you get, the types of violence you get at these different levels of society. And uh, I also summarize this in, in Human Potential for Peace because I think it is, is really critical and so important to pay attention to. Uh, again, with the bands, you get interpersonal disputes, but you, you don't get group on group aggression. Uh, with the tribes, then feuding becomes quite possible as lineage A gets into feuds with lineage B and then lineage C comes along and allies with lineage A and then those two uh, you know, fighting B until B allies with lineage D and, and so on and so forth. Or you can just have a situation of one person is killed and the next is killed in reciprocity and you don't care who you're killing just as long as if a, a person was killed, now the people from lineage A want to kill a person from lineage B. So this is all you know, ethnographically documented across various societies. But when you get into the chiefdoms, and again, this is a simplification because there's chiefdoms with strong chiefs and chiefdoms with really weak chiefs. And you know, it, it's almost a, a hierarchy of, of chiefdomdom within this category, really. Um, but, but the overall feature is that somebody has the power now to order others um, to get on the battlefield and fight so that the chief can you know, get more land or have more prestige or expand his trading network or what have you. And um, you know, looping back to your question about, more about ecology and economics, hunter-gatherers, the nomadic foragers, they don't have much to fight over. You know, they're, they, they're all there with what they can carry uh, when they move from one campsite to the next, it's not like they're you know have a lot of stocks and bonds or e even a food supply. They're hunting and gathering on a daily basis, so there's nothing to plunder and pillage really. Uh, we'll come back to the question of women because that's an interesting one uh, as well shortly. But when you get a chiefdom, you you get building up of surpluses, which give that chief power and influence, and then all of a sudden there's things that could be raided. Uh, it, it's not quite true to say tribes don't have resources. You know, they do, especially herding um, tribes that are herding animals and so forth. Those can be, uh, you know, stolen as well. 
so rustling can occur. But, you know, thinking in terms of the broader picture, it's really with chiefdoms and states that you get vast quantities of wealth, of material goods, of land, uh, et cetera, um, that are worth fighting over. So that's, that's really important. I don't see this linked so carefully to um, particular ecological circumstances. I, I may be wrong about this. It's not been so carefully studied to the best of my knowledge, uh, although it probably should deserve much more attention. So when it comes to hunter-gatherers specifically, I mean, it seems that they move a lot around. They are nomadic. But, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, do they have any sense of territoriality and could it be the case that sometimes different tribes, for example, would, would wage war against each other to acquire a new territory with, for example, more resources or not? It, it tends to be, like, like I mentioned, I didn't go into all of them, but, you know, for about nine different reasons, you wouldn't expect that. And in fact, ethnographically, that type of thing is pretty rare to non-existent. Um, there's a complication here I'll mention, too, with some of the ethnographic data, and that's that people sometimes assume, oh, this is just pristine and this is the way it was without taking into consideration, for example, in North America, that Europeans arrived and, and they started having huge influences of various kinds on all the native peoples. Basically, tribes in the east were wiped out and or pushed west crowding tribes that were already located in areas and so forth. Spanish introduced the horse. Um, some of the um, band societies took up the horse as an incredible new adaptation and began hunting buffalo and raiding each other for horses. So to just look at this in terms of, oh wow, look at all this war going on on the, on the Great Plains of North America as these groups have horses and are raiding each other is to just start the clock, you know, when you're already in the middle of the afternoon, uh, your, your time coming up on four o'clock, I guess, without considering what happened that morning or around noon or even in the early afternoon, historically and ecologically to those groups. So in, in the recent centuries, and, and in fact, going on over a millennia or two, you've had ever increasing influences of groups affecting near, neighboring groups, conquering areas, you know, even the archaic states, and the, and the archaic states go back at, at most 6,000 years ago. So starting about 6,000 years ago, uh, empires developed, whether we're talking in the Near East or we're talking Egypt coming in a bit later, the, the New World Civilizations, right? These are now true states with standing armies practicing cannibalism in some cases. They have slavery. So a lot of these real nasties really either came in or became um, really magnified with states. Leaping, leaping back just a little bit to your previous, your previous question. But, but, but that's really important to consider uh, the, the histories that are going on here and not just look at nomadic foragers and willy-nilly say, well, look at this group of Plains Indians. They're basically foragers. They do have horses now and they're raiding each other and killing each other. Look, they practiced war, so therefore, we project this back deep into the past. This is just human nature. Yet another fallacy to this thinking is to ignore recent world history, to, to put it that way. And maybe now we could introduce the topic of fighting over women or women as sexual resources that, uh, for example, uh, undergatherers or horticulturalists, and I'm referring the horticulturalists now because I mean, I think that the most influential piece of science that really brought to the table this idea that um, um, traditional societies can fight to acquire more women or men can kill other men to acquire women from other tribes, other groups, etc. Uh, came from the studies that Napoleon Shagnon has done on the, on the Yanomamo and they are a uh, horticulturalist society, yes. right? So what would you have to say about that? I, I'm going to give you two different types of answers to this one. Um, so first, let's talk about the Yanomamo for a, a bit. Napoleon Shagnon had written back in 1988 a very controversial issue. He, he proposed that killers have more kids, in essence. And in, in an article published in this very prestigious journal, Science, um, he presented data tables that supposedly showed this. Now, subsequently, his research has been 
critiqued by a variety, literally a dozen if not two dozen anthropologists on all types of, of uh, grounds. Um, at one extreme you have ethical complaints and, and critiques of how he conducted himself in the field and, and so forth. But in terms of the, the methodology and, and the theory, um, I decided when I was writing Human Potential for Peace to look more carefully at his data. And I got this idea from a, a short piece that, again, Brian Ferguson, who I mentioned earlier, had written, raising a question, um, do these different groups, the non-killers and the killers, in, in Shagnon's article, are they really the same age, as Shagnon says, groups of comparable age? And I looked at that data table, and I could see why Brian was raising this question. Well, it, it basically resulted in several months on and off of doing a lot of reflecting and thinking and with my, literally a hand calculator. And one thing I did was I, I, I went back to Napoleon Shagnon's other publications and pulled out data that he published elsewhere and cross-checked it with data that he published about killers ostensibly having more kids. And by using this sort of triangulation approach of data published from different sources, all by Napoleon Shagnon, all in the same region and so forth, I was able to demonstrate with basically simple mathematics that the killers um, and, and the non-killers did have very different ages. So at an absolute minimum, the groups that were unikai is what they're called in Yanomamo, if you've killed someone and undergone a purification ceremony, Unikais were at a very minimum 10.4 years older than the non-killing group. And I say at the very minimum, I, I suspect it was a bit more than that, but I actually presented the findings at three different levels so people could look and assess um, what level of difference would lead to what number of, of kids. So um, there was also an interesting factor there when you looked at the data that headmen tended to have more wives, they tended to be older, and the, the headman effect was skewing this also. So long story short, and uh, anybody who's really interested in this, um, I, I've written on it, so I'd be happy to provide references or, or people can look and see and so forth. Ten, ten pages of footnotes in the back of Human Potential for Peace, where I, piece where I show the math and everything. Um, interestingly, Napoleon Shagnon and I got into a, an email exchange a while after this, and Napoleon um, Shagnon said, well, it, it looks interesting what Fry has done, but it's all wrong. So I wrote him and said, well, what, what is the age difference then between your killers and your non-killers? That was the first time I asked, and I, I got a lot of blah, blah, and no answer. So I wrote again, and I said, okay, so... You are the guy that collected the data. You are the guy that had the data. You are the guy that published your findings. What actually is the age difference? If I'm wrong when I say at an absolute minimum, the killers are 10.4 years older than the non-killers, hence they have more kids in part because they're older, longer time to reproduce, right? More time to acquire wives, right? So it's pretty, pretty sensible. So he dodged the question the second time. And so I tried one, one more third time in this sort of ongoing back and forth. Uh, it was on, I guess, what, it was the evolutionary psych list at that point where you, you know, you're writing comments and so forth. So he, he said he didn't have time for further discussion of this. And he, he wrote his memoirs, as you may know, and they came out, um, I think they also came out, did they come out in 2011? I'm well, not sure. Maybe, maybe a little more recently than that. I'm, and I'm not thinking, um, but I, I did write a book review of that. And I tried to be very, very fair uh, to the book. But um, I noticed with some um, discontent that when he discussed the Yanomamo and killers having more kids, he simply presented the same data from that he published before in, in 1988, simply put it in there again without a mention of the various critiques that Brian Ferguson or I and various others have made of, of that study. So I said in my book review to this, again, not being too harsh, I think, but just being quite fair, that if you publish something 30 years ago and various people have critiqued it, and if you're an advocate of science, which Napoleon Shagnon has advocated across his career, then I, I think 
it would be good for him to reflect on why is he not then taking a scientific approach to this and rethinking or responding in a serious way to the types of uh, mathematical arguments as, as well as various other um, critiques that, that his colleagues have you know, presented of, of his original findings. Because I think that's really the way that then science moves forward, right? You don't just wait 30 years and say you were right and ignore, well, in fact, he's not even saying he's right because he doesn't mention the critiques. So just republishing 30 some years later, that doesn't move us forward. But, but basically, we have the problem with the math, we have the problem with the, the data here. And, and, and in fact, you know, the, there's more problems. I'm just sort of focusing on the math at the moment as, as a major one, clearly. But um, th this is, again, I think, looping back, reflecting a narrative where it, it, it fits what people expect, right? And it also fits more specifically what the, many of the people in this, this new field of evolutionary psychology already presume to be the case. And I, I think you may be coming to this a little later, so if you are, I'll, I'll sort of hold off. But I would like to talk at, at some point about the evolutionary psychology take on human aggression and specifically on warfare, which is so out of kilter, again, with, with what you can see uh, anthropologically, archaeologically, and in fact, uh, incorporating data from a variety of other fields as well. And, and my interpretation of, of how there's such a huge disconnect here it's again looping us back to the cultures which we as, as scholars and scientists have been born into with our Western uh, traditions that, that view us towards these views. And again, if we want to either take my perspective of science is good and science is important, or the evolutionary psychologists and, and William Shagnon who argue the same thing, well, this, this really gives us an opportunity to really investigate how some of these cultural assumptions and biases and traditions are actually shaping our, our thinking. And uh, I would argue, we can get into it in a minute, like I say, I'd love to talk with Restraint about you, that's one of my, my ace cards, really. Um, but uh, they're, they're really shaping things, really affecting things in a negative way. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could get into that right away, but uh, perhaps um, talking a little bit about the yeah. evolution of violence diffusing mechanisms because maybe yeah. would you agree that maybe that's one of the things that uh, I mean maybe mainstream evolutionary psychologists that do work on those types of issues like human aggression or the mm -hmm. one or the ones that write popular books on that um, maybe they don't pay as much attention as they should to those types of things. I mean, I mean, maybe they focus too much on the aggression and the war side of things and too little yes. even and, could, and they could even look back at other species and not even necessarily only primates because it seems to me that it's fairly uh, ubiquitous in uh, uh, across the animal realm that I mean individuals and even societies I mean they, they don't uh, indiscriminately go against one another or I mean they, they other animals also have violence diffusing mechanisms yes and and, and actually as, as you were asking this really important question um, I, I was realizing that you'd asked about fighting over women before, and I answered in terms of Yanomamo and Shagnon, um, but I didn't address that anthropologically. And, and so they, they interconnect, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just say a word about another answer to the, the women question, and then we'll get into to your new question. Um, okay. It's really interesting to me. Again, again my, my colleague Patrick Soderberry, who is um, a Swedish-speaking Finn, uh, in, in, living in Finland, he was a doctoral student when we worked together on this. And, and, and he and I um, looked at what are the reasons for um, aggression in the sample of nomadic foragers. And what we found a fair amount of them was uh, over women in some way. And if you read you know, some biology or even watch the nature programs, it, you understand, I think, that animals, mammals at least, uh, are, are often males are fighting over females in, in a variety of species. 
So I, I think this is an interesting tie-in, and we can talk a little bit more about that and how it relates to aggression and so forth. But with the nomadic forager group, you tend to have these as very uh, personal disputes, if you will, just like among most animal species. They're not a reason to go to war. You, you don't have a, a Helen of Troy effect, is, is what I could call it, where whole groups go to war when some woman runs off with uh, another guy. Rather, it's the jilted husband might grab a brother or a cousin or something and say, let's go get her back. And very occasionally that, that leads to aggression and, and lethal aggression. But um, more, more typically, it's worked out in a variety of ways with third parties coming in to mediate or the husband just goes, yeah, what the hell, I'll get another wife and so on. All types of scenarios come out. But if you look just at the, the lethal end, as Patrick and I, I did, um, you do find that that's a fairly common reason for, for lethal aggression in nomadic foragers. And so that's interesting. But um, if you change the types of social organization we've been talking about, uh, and you get very patriarchal societies that are based on agriculture, for instance, uh, the role of women goes way down. Women become viewed as commodities. And here you, you, you know, basically have the, the birth of all of this, um, these sexist and misogynist types of practices where women are treated uh, as if they were material goods in many ways. And, and it's a, you, know, you can look at these different societies and see how this does make sense from an evolutionary um, perspective of males wanting to pass on their genes and so forth. But you also have to consider the context of these. I'm, I'm sure that, that uh, people everywhere enjoy sex, right? <laughs> and men and women have their different patterns of um, when to have sex, what's, what's a good mate. And one thing that strikes me as an overarching bias here is to look at this, uh, whether you're in evolutionary psychology or more generally a, across the social sciences and so forth over the last decades, is, is to really leave out the perspective of the woman so it's hard now, after decades or, or even 100 or 200 years of this, to go back and sometimes tease out um, the, the women's perspective here. But, you know, there are some anthropological cases that really suggest that women in, in nomadic forager groups uh, are basically very egalitarian. Uh, the, the groups are egalitarian in terms of gender relations and so forth. So women um, decide very much when they're going to get divorced or if they're going to leave one man for another man and, and basically this type of thing. So I don't want to perpetuate by talking about men killing men over women. Um, I want to point out, yeah, this, this does happen. It's recorded ethnographically, but it doesn't mean that the women have no roles and they're just pawns uh, in these types of societies either. So that, that should be a corrective, I think, going forward to, to think about um, how the sexist perceptions from our more recent um, cultural histories are shaping our views of, of looking what's going on in these nomadic forager bands. Uh, in my research, I found a, a few cases of a woman being kidnapped or taken off in a nomadic band context, but I also found some cases where ethnographers explicitly said, well, there's not really much point of a man trying to keep a woman against her will because she'll go off gathering and not come back. You know, it's hunting and gathering society. Women are out gathering, men are out get He doesn't have a standing army to lock her up, doesn't have a chastity belt. So uh, there's a, usually in most of these societies, to make a, a generalization, there's quite a lot of premarital and, and extramarital sex going on. And I would say, again, as a generalization in nomadic forager band societies, as long as you don't do it just, you know, in somebody's face, um, people sort of understand this is going on, they act discreetly. Uh, and, and yeah, sometimes there's quarrels and fights and arguments and so forth, but for the most part, you know, another scenario is just, well, she's probably having sex with some guys. Well, I'm having sex with some women. So uh, it just depends a lot on the society as to how this, this really plays out and fighting over women and so forth. So you do see this type of rating, rating over women at other levels of social organization. You tend not to see it as a pattern in, in nomadic foragers. So back to, to your second question, and really important question. Um, one point I'd really like to emphasize is this muddling, this ongoing muddling of war with aggression. I think we have to tease these things apart. So if you look towards mammalian patterns of aggression, you find it across many species, 
And there's good reasons for this. It wouldn't exist if it was not beneficial to uh, individuals across many, many um, millennia of, of evolutionary time, right? Of evolutionary time. Um, so you can look at maternal aggression protecting the young. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's sort of a no-brainer. We could dig into it, but uh, you talk about two males fighting for access to mate with a female. Okay, that again can make some sense. Or you, fight in, you know, find in territorial species, individuals fighting to carve out their, their, nating, uh, their mating area and hence again be able to mate and pass on their genes and so forth. There's, of course, defensive aggression uh, against predators that various species will, will, you know, first flee if you can, seems to be rule number one, fight or flight. Um, okay, so as a, a gross generalization across mammalian patterns, aggression exists in various forms, seems to have various different types of functions. And if you use that sort of lens, I've, I've argued in various publications and, and look at humans, well, I would argue we're not really so different from that overall pattern. Um, Regression can be very necessary if, if you all of a sudden find yourself attacked by a huge assailant. Uh, you might try to flee, right? A huge assailant, much bigger than me? Uh, I'll take off. Uh, but if it's like a fight to the situation, you probably will fight back in defensive aggression. And again, if we, if we go and use the nomadic foragers as, as just one source of information on this, as I've emphasized that much of the fighting is between two men over a, a woman. So that, to me, is just so mammalian. But let's not stop there. Again, I want to insert here, real importantly, that's not war. That's not warfare. Group on group aggression, right, would be warfare. Um, maybe one community against another fits into many uh, definitions. I think in everybody's definition, it's more than one person attacking more than one person. It's not just, unless we're talking poetically, you know, he, he raged war on his rival. Yeah, that's language issues. We have that, right? But when we come down to thinking about what war is, it's a group phenomenon. It's often between members of different societies, or at least different components of, of a given society. It involves mul multiple actors, perpetrators, and there's lethal intent. You're not just engaging in a football game. Everybody will have a beer afterwards and go home. That's not war. But if you're there armed to the teeth and trying to kill members of the other community and you don't particularly kill, care who you kill as long as they're a, a warrior on the other side. So, so I like to use definitions of war that make sense to us, or I should say correspond with how we understand war to occur in our definition, in our context. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be smaller scale with less people, but it has to be multiple people and, and multiple people engaged in a lethal combat. So when you look at that, I'll loop us back to our archaeological discussion. That type of warfare, a group on group warfare, is something that arose in humans um, relatively recently. And it didn't arise willy-nilly just for the hell of it. it. It arose when social conditions and ecological subsistence-based conditions and population increase all interact in a way that then make um, war more likely. And it makes war more likely because you have more people. You have the personnel that now can engage in war. You have, very importantly, things to fight over. You also have a hierarchy where you have leaders that have the power to coerce other people to fight for them. And there's there's reasons that those leaders want to fight. They want the prestige. They want to expand their their kingdom. They want to expand their chiefdom. They want to exact tribute from the hinterland surrounding their empire. So this is not a mystery, and it is archaeologically documented, and it's recent. So one real problem I have with the arguments talking about the evolution of war and then, sleight of hand, introducing cases of aggression either subtly or not so subtly, e either on purpose uh, as uh, understanding that the, that the person is just trying to make an argument so they do this, or perhaps unconsciously, and just sort of seeing uh, war and aggression as, as linked. And that we can talk about war, we can talk about aggression, it's all really sort of the same thing. I really think we need to look at that more carefully in a theoretical way. 
And in fact, I've, I've, I've argued this um, various times, but in Human Potential for Peace, I devote several chapters to point out why aggression, interpersonal aggression, has an evolutionary heritage, and it fulfills certain patterns across mammals, and, and in humans, we were matching this um, in large part, and um, warfare is being a, a distinct, well, I won't say distinctly human phenomenon, but something that, that humans do as one of the few species that do engage in a group, group, um, lethal type of aggression. Ants do that too, right? So it's not distinctly or uniquely human, but it's pretty rare, pretty rare across the, the animal species. So I mean, an interesting side question here is, you know, what are the features that make this so unique in human? In humans, um, but to stay to stay on your topic of uh, evolutionary thinking, so if if we, on the one hand, consider aggression as uh, a long-standing mammalian trait, the next question is, or the next issue is, how much is that is is lethal aggression? And we have various sources of information that suggests a pretty small fraction of that actually leads to lethality in humans as well as in other mammals. And there's been, uh, I think I sent it to you earlier when we were emailing, what I consider to be a, a really nicely done study that uh, corroborates this across such a huge sample of, of over 1,000 species of mammals. How often, what's the percentage of deaths in these species that are a result of a, 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 a member of that same species killing a member of the same species? and and it's very slightly, you know, from one species to the next, as you would expect. There's a lot of species that there's just no recorded deaths whatsoever among mammals. And then there's other species that have higher kill rates, but they are all really small. The, the, the overall average for mammals is less than 1%, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty, pretty small. If you bring in information as to how animals fight, you see this restraint just blasting there, you know, flashing signs, restraint, restraint, restraint. Don't kill, don't get yourself killed. Um, so anyway, another aspect of this, this Gomez et al. study, which is, is really intriguing, is that it also shows the effect of social organization on patterns of human aggression. And interestingly, uh, it does support Steven Pinker's point that when you have modern states the overall level of aggression goes down if you're looking at the, the killings um, within those states. But um, it does not support his contention that war goes forever backwards. Because when they used archaeological data, it's, it's again a pretty impressive, massive study, they, they found out that the, the old nomadic foragers do not deviate, the archaeological nomadic foragers do not deviate from what you'd expect a mammal the typical mammal to be to be engaged. Well, I, let me clarify this. We got to talk a little bit about primates because we're primates. He, human killing in the past was typically what you'd expect for a member of a primate species, which is at most two percent. So, um, some you can look at it. You, know, you can play the number game. Two percent. That's outrageous. That's huge. You know, that's one person in fifty died of violence. Or you can say two percent. That's really hardly anything. Yeah. So, one conclusion from this is that humans are, are not more aggressive, lethally aggressive, than you would expect us to be as just a member of our, our ordered primates. And this fits with their finding, Gomez and, and all, et al.'s finding, that um, social species tend to have more lethal aggression and territorial species tend to have more lethal aggression. Primates tend to often be social and sometimes be territorial. So we're, we're right on the benchmark. So um, when I talk about humans being mammals, this is the type of argument that I'm, I'm making in, in terms of aggression and so forth. We're not the species that is just out of control, crazy aggression. Uh, another conclusion that's important that also comes out of their data and across anthropology in general is that we're a very flexible species and of course social factors, socialization and social organization are really important. So you see variations across different types of society in terms of the amounts of, of aggression and so forth. So you can't just turn a blind eye and assume all humans everywhere 
are the same. We have that potential to be the same or different. It's the learning and the environmental influences, including the social organization, that is, is really important. So these are, I think, all important things to be thinking about. Um, if you allow me just a minute here, I want to make a, a point about restraint. Sure. Um, I, I've read quite a bit of evolutionary psychologists. Uh, uh, I have been interested in the evolution of aggression and evolution of other factors for quite a long time. And uh, it, I only mention this because people sometimes presume with my interest of peace and being an anthropologist that I've not actually been trained in um, study of aggression, but actually my PhD is in physical anthropology or biological anthropology. And I took as a grad student various courses in the biology department. And this was one of my interests. So I, I have studied quite a, a bit about this. And I mentioned this in part, so, you know, say put my credentials on the table um, as someone who's not just another one of these flaky social cultural anthropologist that doesn't know what he's talking about, um, as I have been actually accused of being erroneously. Um, the other point to mention this is the historical development of evolutionary psychology as a field is relatively recent. And I'm, I'm sure you and many of your listeners know that it was initially called sociobiology. And mm -hmm. Edward Wilson is largely credited with giving it that name when his 1975 book, Sociobiology, was published and so forth. But it underwent a name change and to some degree a shift in disciplines towards psychology rather than remaining in biology. And, and of course, now you find evolutionary psychologists, in quote, you know, in anthropology, maybe they call themselves evolutionary anthropologists and so forth. My point here, which is a bit ironic, is at least many of the early evolutionary psychologists did not actually receive good training in evolutionary theory. And let's just look at Steven Pinker in a very abstract way. He's a psychologist, renowned psychologist from Harvard, but basically his training and specialization initially was in linguistics. So as I read, you know, his chapter two from Better Natures of Our, our what am I trying to say? I'm blowing his title. Um, the, the, the Better Angels best, of Our Nature. Thank you for your help with that one. <laughs> Better angels of our, our nature. Um, he's very dismissive of anthropology, but also if you look at his writings more generally, he's not um, conveying a, a, a good background knowledge in evolutionary theory or how the whole thing works. So it's really a bit ironic that we have one of the lead writers, um, you know, supposedly representing this new take on humanity, the evolutionary psychology and evolution and so forth, and let me be specific to back this up. You know, I'm not trying to be ad hominem. I'm just making observations about people's training and, and what they they know and so forth. We, we already talked about sort of this misuse of archaeological data in his, his chapter. Um, but I, I think also when he just presents it as we're a pretty aggressive species, therefore we wore a lot we wore a lot um, because it's in our nature, et cetera. Um, that's, again, not, not good science. And if you look at the evolutionary perspective on aggression from biology over, over decades, and if you look towards the anthropology from either a biological or a social cultural perspective, I would argue the evolutionary psychologists as a group are really missing a major point as they write about war and they write about aggression, they focus on war and they focus on aggression, what they're ignoring is the fact that this is a small minority of cases where there's lethality and how does that happen? Mm -hmm. It totally contradicts this narrative, right? So if you look around human societies, we're, you know, we're counting homicides in terms of per 100,000. So we're not counting homicides in terms of per 100. We're counting them in terms of per 100,000 a year, right? So that should tell us something. Th these rates are really low across societies. Yes, you, you know, you can look to a, a, a nation like uh, Colombia recently or El Salvador and some other ones that you find really high homicide rates. Well, they're talking maybe in the 40s or 50s per 100,000. Uh, you can look at a, a very low homicide country like Iceland or Japan where it's less than one per 100,000. So there's variation, but overall... Humans are not killing each other in any society rampantly. 
And when this does happen, it, it, you know, very rarely, it's, it's just really unusual. So that's just one context to it. But the, the, over, the overall evolutionary point I'm trying to make here is what's interesting is that, you know, you're supposed to survive and reproduce, not ethically or morally, but this is the, the select, these are the selection pressures that have been operating on mammals generally and humans in particular. So what humans are really great about, as are other mammals, is to, you know, engage in some agonism, I'll call it that, which includes threatening and displays, which involve no contact, for example, getting what they might want, the female or the area of space or the food resource at the moment or whatever, but not putting themselves at risk. So... Um, Maybe, maybe you have some specific questions you'd like to ask me about this one. But basically what I'm advocating is, um, please, evolutionary psychologists, again, step back from this. Look at the overwhelming data here that shows that humans, and in fact mammals, are not these killing machines. And, and yes, look at the aggression, that's fine. Tease it apart from warfare. These are two distinct phenomena. Uh, but also, just look at all the restraint against lethal aggression, against serious aggression that we see all the time out there. So, as far as I understand, you're not completely dismissing evolutionary psychology. Is, is, it's just that you think that when it comes specifically to war and aggression, uh, they link them together too quickly and don't distinguish the uh, particularities of war or the particular context where it happens. They simply say that it is part of human nature as if it was another, uh, I don't know, evolved mechanism that we have in our minds, I mean, to, to wage war against another society or something like that but also that maybe um, they are not paying enough attention to mechanisms that humans and primates and other mammals have to prevent violence from occurring and from escalating and those sorts of things. Right? Absolutely, yes. And I mean, of course, we're talking, I'm talking about a whole discipline of people, sometimes from different fields, but under this label, evolutionary psychologists. So what I'm trying to point out here is what, what I see as a predominant trend towards doing the things you just listed. For instance, lumping aggression and, and war together as if they were really the same phenomenon. That I think really needs to be questioned. And, and I think I'm on very solid ground here when I say as an overall assessment, we see all this focus on the murderer next door and the, the gene, the genetic um, benefits of engaging in aggression, you know, the Napoleon killer, Shagnon, uh, killers have more kids type of arguments, and all of the reiterations of this, um, that study that's, that's basically so flawed, they're just really running off the group, you know, the herd of evolutionary psychologists, in my opinion, is just running this way, uh, 180 degrees away from what you really see if you step back and look at patterns of aggression from an evolutionary perspective. And I'm, I, I certainly don't consider myself to be an evolutionary psychologist in the extent that I, I have so many difficulties with so much of what's written in that discipline. I absolutely consider myself to be an evolutionary thinker. And I think if, if somebody, and I, I have my Vita online, if they want to go back and, and look at the types of things I've published, my very first article as a graduate student was called um, Levels of Aggression, uh, Levels of Selection in Pertaining to um, Aggression, the Evolution of Aggression. I'm going to botch my own title. Let me think what it is. Um, the Level of Selection Controversy and the Evolution of Aggression, I think, catches it. And, and that's really where I explored way back then, early in my, my thinking on this. Uh, the problems with group selection when it comes to how aggression evolved uh, in mammals. So I've been thinking and writing and, and working on this for quite a long time. And um, I, I know it's, it's hard as, as one person to try to do a, a so-called corrective when you have people like, like Steven Pinker broadcasting in the other direction. So again, let me loop back to where we started early in the conversation. I, I do really have a, a faith in science and scientists, and 
part of that is I, I really think that scientists want to get at the truth. They want to get at a, a good, clear, justifiable understanding of phenomena. And if we start with that and uh, encourage those canons of good science, I have the faith that people step back and, and look at what's going on with mammalian aggression, what's going on with human aggression, that they'll see a lot of similarities. And uh, I would hope many of, of these scholars will go, wow, how, how silly not to have noticed that so much of the aggression is bravado and, and bluster and display and, and threat and machismo and all of this, whereas the number of fights are much lower and the numbers of lethal fights are much lower than that. And in fact, this really much fits what you see in other mammalian species. And wow, we humans are mammals after all. We fit that pattern. So we're not, you know, to take one particular opposing view, we are not programmed to engage in coalitional lethal aggression. I think that's actually a very good example. If you look at all the ink that is spilt uh, by evolutionary psychologists and others looking at different aspects of this presumption that humans are somehow uh, predestined or have a tendency towards or psychological predisposition. These are all terms that are used in the literature, right? To attack members of other groups, you know, when the risks are low. No. That's, again, the herd running off in the wrong direction uh, from what evolutionary theory and what the data show us. So I challenge my colleagues, you know, step back, take another look. If you want to be scientists, check it out. So uh, let's just explore one last topic, because we've been talking about uh, the evolutionary basis of war and aggression or lack thereof, right? Uh, and also the conditions that bring war about, let's say. Um, but you also written uh, quite a lot on mechanisms or uh, let's say political mechanisms of preventing war and even potentially, I don't know, somewhere in the future, rendering war obsolete. So could you tell us about that? And I, I mean, do, do you think mostly about mechanisms that people can apply at the national level uh, or, or a more international one? I mean, I mean, could you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, so let me start with the, the sort of the broad contextualizing of this. Um, I edited a book, War, Peace and Human Nature. So it's a compilation of many chapters by different people and, and so forth. And one thing that emerged from that and, and other uh, thinking and writing uh, exhibitions that I've been on here, or expeditions I've been on, um, is to s turn it around and think about the peacefulness and the prosociality of, of humans. And, and basically, you know, I, I'm just talking about the herd running in the wrong direction. One other way that, that the herd's going off in the other direction is to so summarily dismiss and minimize all of the prosociality that we humans are capable of on a daily basis. And again, I think much of this stems from our own society, our social values, the way we've been socialized and brought up, and views of human nature that stem back in our our you know cultural legacy and traditions. But if you consider real world examples of natural disasters, earthquakes and hurricanes and other traumas, mass shootings, immediately people are helping. They are there to help. And this is a source of data that's commented on periodically in news media and, and so forth. But if someone reflects on what this is really telling us about a human nature, even in situations where it's risky, we can go out of our way to, to help people in distress who, who need our help. And most people are just inclined to do that and do that so automatically that it doesn't take any think. So I think that didn't take any thinking. So I, I think that's a, an interesting line of argument to pursue. A, another one, just thinking about prosociality, is we are such a, a dependent species. Infants, of course, you know, this is not anything new, but developmental psychologists, anthropologists have been noting how dependent the human infant is uh, compared to other species. No, none of us would be here if others didn't care for us, right? We really need that care. And it, you can extend that, everybody gets sick, whether it's the flu or something more serious, a broken bone. Uh, there's examples archeologically and of course, 
rampantly from cultural circumstances in our own society of, of caring for the sick and the ill and and so forth. So these are all very pro-social tendencies, but I, I just think, you know, we sometimes, all this focus on war and aggression and violence and conflict, uh, we, we totally miss to a degree what's right in front of our face on a daily basis in terms of the cooperation, and the helping, the altruism, the nurturing, and, and the caring, and, and so forth. And you mentioned at the beginning, I, I do just a, a moment of self-promotion here. Um, Rianne Eisler and I have just just written this book, it's just come out, Nurturing Our Humanity. And the, the theory there really stems from Rianne's work, where she points out that some societies are very dominance-oriented and others are more partnership-oriented. But what we do in this book is we really holistically, holistically look across a whole variety of disciplines and so forth and develop this, this theme that we have choice as humans. We have choice in, in our societies. We can emphasize the domination, the violence, the inequalities, the just not caring. And in fact, that shapes the way individuals' brains are developed and the way they, they perceive the world and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's the dominant side. But if you go along a continuum of, of societies and possibilities towards partnership, I argue in the book, in a, in a chapter that I basically penned, that those nomadic foragers are just a wonderful example of partnership societies for all the food sharing that goes on, which is rampant. It's in every single ethnography I've ever read, they share meat. You know, that's pretty, that's a universal sharing, sharing, caring, befriending, tending, loving, use the four letter word love. Uh, this is in our, in our face all the time if you look at human behavior. And it's not there by accident either. Let's go back to evolutionary theory, right? What, what do people need to survive and reproduce? They, they need love, care, cooperation, collaboration, you know, all the good stuff that we somehow, yeah, yeah, we know about that. Now let's talk about war. So <laughs> that's, that's uh, sort of warming us up for an answer here to your, your question. Uh, I wrote an article, I, I was invited to write it, so I was really happy to have the chance to think about how we could promote global peace. And since I'm an anthropologist and I've, I've looked a lot at different cultures and circumstances, I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do with this one. I'm going to talk about peace systems. And, and peace systems are clusters of neighboring societies that don't make war with each other. So, you know, to engage in the real flight of fancy, which I hope can become a reality, is if, if we have clusters of, of world societies, of world nations that don't make war on each other, we could have a global peace system. So um, what exists is possible, right? To paraphrase Kenneth Boulding, um, there are peace systems. And uh, my colleagues and I are, are researching this um, in cooperation with, with Peter Coleman at Columbia University and various colleagues there. We're looking at how you can develop sustainable peace. And the peace systems work is just one way to look at this. And what I'm uh, hypothesizing, and, and we're in the midst of analyzing data now, uh, comparing various peace systems with non-peace systems, it certainly appears that there are key factors that are important here. For example, when you have social units, whether they be nations or whether they be tribes that are clustered together, that are augmenting um, the interconnections amongst them, whether it be trade or intermarriage uh, or just friendships and contact, but positive contact. So that's one factor. If you have it pushing that a little more interdependencies, that may also be really important. I mean, this is sort of a standard argument from political science. A third feature here that I would argue promotes peace is shared overarching identity. And for, for example, um, I now am starting to consider myself to be a, a member of the Greensboro, North Carolina community. I've just been here a month. Um, so that's one level of identity. Next, I'll start thinking of myself as being a, a North Carolinian, right? But this doesn't mean that I'm not a, a person in the United States, a US citizen. And it doesn't mean that I can't think of myself as a human being on this planet that we all share, a shared human uh, identification. So what we find with peace systems is that when there is a multiple level of identity that includes overarching ac across the subunits, people start thinking really of themselves as, as one 
people. And sometimes it's expressed exactly that way ethnographically. So um, the, these are, are some structural elements. We can also talk with, with humans about the importance of values and norms uh, and the symbols and rituals, uh, the legends, the, the narratives that reinforce these things. And as I think about where we are, you know, 21st century, early 21st century, war has not been abolished on the planet. But we do have some insights as to how this could come about by creating shared identities, by creating mutual interdependencies, by realizing the extent to which we're interdependent. I mean, this whole ecological crisis that we're facing, that really imposes on humanity and interdependence. It's not going to do any good. Um, you know, in terms of saving rainforests, if one country continues to burn rainforests, I'm talking about Brazil here, you might might gather since that's in the news right now. But I mean, it, it could be, you know, different different topics, but the point is we're ecologically interlinked and interdependent. So this is an imposed persuasion or uh, on all of us, on all of humanity to really work together and and to pull up, in my view, these various pro-social capacities and tendencies which we're capable of doing. So in some way it's the, let's get back to the garden, if the garden metaphorically is the nomadic hunter-gatherer past, and understand that it's not really all about war and aggression and violence and, and stealing women and all this stuff that is, is all too often emphasized. That if you really step back from our human nature, yes, we have the capacity for that, but we also have a whole different pro-social cooperative capacity. And if we're going to abolish war, and if we're going to solve the climate change issue, just got to get down and, and draw on those capacities and really get to it and do it. So I think we can get to it and do it. And the more people who understand that it's not in our nature just to war and fight all the time, that opens up the, the possibility to think anew about this and understand, what, look at the, the cooperative endeavors that we have accomplished already as a species and where we can go in the future. So your focus is mostly on interdependence like in things like, like for example, uh, political collaborative enterprises between, for example, different nations, uh, like for example, at the, at the political, the diplomatic, the economic levels and things like that. So, I, I mean, if nations are more interdependent among themselves, then the potential for war decreases. Is that well, the case? Like I say, we're, we're in the midst of hopefully okay. having some good, hard scientific data to see which influences might be more important than others and which ones have minimal impact. But as a set of hypotheses, uh, we're now at the point, and I, the, the, the we here is not the royal we, of course. It's I've worked with various students, and I mentioned the collaborators at Columbia and so forth. So, so that's sort of the we when I'm talking about this uh, peace systems research. But I mentioned the shared identity, certainly the interdependence that you just commented on, but also the interconnections we talked about, whether they're, they're um, financial or uh, familial or, or what have you, and then norms and values and also these types of social mechanisms that reinforce them. You know, for instance, the uh, United States used to be 13 colonies that had individual identities uh, back at the times of the Revolutionary War. So gradually over time, they purposely augmented and in fact to some degree of natural developed a sense of we are United States. And of course, now people have these multiple identities. They can be from Virginia, but they also are a member of the United States and so on and so forth. So the same type of thing you, you spot in other anthropological cases. And I, I would argue we're seeing this exactly in Europe, you know, two steps forward, one step back towards a shared identity. But already many Europeans uh, on the news and in private conversations and things that they write are talking about themselves as Europeans. You're, European, so you're well familiar with this, and maybe you agree or disagree, but it, it just tickles me every time I hear this. And, and I taught and, and lived and worked in Finland for almost 20 years, and we took in a lot of exchange students from um, different parts of the country, nearby um, where you are speaking from in Spain, Germany, um, et cetera, Poland. And I understood this new generation of college students had this multiple sense of identity, they would just 
leave Poland and go up to Finland as if in the United States, by analogy, they're leaving Texas and then going to Indiana and so forth. And of course, the structures that are in place of unified passport, no border control, um, same currency, the euro and so on and so forth, made these types of things all the more easy. But over time, you get this shared identity and uh, and so on and so forth. So on, on our list of hypotheses for what's important for peace systems, we also have, again, something to look at, the importance of leadership that explicitly puts forth narratives of peace. And um, that's yet another one that, that, that we think is important. Another element would be conflict management mechanisms that are able to deal with conflicts among different units that come up. There's, there's going to be conflicts. They just don't have to be played out in terms of war or violence. So um, conflict management mechanisms, whether they be courts or review boards or arbitration boards or shuttle diplomacy or, or what have you. And an interesting point there, anthropologically, you know, once you get socialized and accustomed to handling disputes in a particular way, you don't question that, you just do it. And I'm saying you, you know, the vast majority of, of us. So, for instance, you know, in the United States, and I imagine in Portugal as well, should there be, a, a, you know, a homicide, you're a victim within your own family, you may feel really angry and, and want to kill that killer if you could get your hands on that person. But you also understand, no, this is something that the police and the court system will deal with because you've been brought up that way and you understand that people have a right to trial and if found guilty, they will be punished. And you don't grab the knife or the gun and try to kill the killer. You know, most of the time it, it happens and that's understandable human emotion. But my point is, same thing at, at the global or international level. Once we just have it established that Europe no longer engages in war, no, we, are, we are the European Union, we are united, we have that level of identity, we have the interconnections, the interdependence, we gave that up. We have the values of tolerance and dealing with disputes uh, through the courts, then you deal with disputes through the courts, through the European Parliament, through the Commission, etc., etc. You have these institutions. And that brings me to yet another element to this, right? Overarching institutions. Um, seem to be important for some peace systems, but not necessarily for all of them. And I think that relates right back to the social uh, organization factor. So by that I mean, um, just as a slight digression here to explain that, if you have a, a peace system uh, amongst tribes or nomadic foragers, which sometimes you exist ethnographically, you don't get that overarching set of institutions. They just sort of naturally inclined not to war to begin with in the case of the nomadic foragers, as we've talked about. But when you get more complex societies like the Iroquois uh, nations before they, they unified, or the United States before it became the United States, or the European Union, the nations of Europe before they unified, in fact, they engaged in World War II rather recently, right? Yeah. So once you move from... Um, this, this lack of overarching institutions towards institutions, then they also, we hypothesize, reinforce the peace at, at these more complex levels of social organization. So you, you see what I've done here is I've listed really a handful of different points and we don't see this as that there's one magical path to eliminating war and setting up a peace system. Rather, we're conceptualizing this as there's multiple factors that influence peace on the one hand or war or allow war on the other hand. So if we can shift the markers, some of them at least, towards the direction of peace, then you may get that magic synergy where peace evolves and peace prevails. And European Union is a, a fantastic example of this, right? Less than a hundred years ago, World War II was just devastating Europe and before that World War I and before that, before that and before that. It's, it's a huge cultural transformation when you think of what's going on in Europe now. And you, you heard me a moment ago say, you know, two steps forward and one step back, you know, but as an overall success story, Europe has eliminated uh, warfare within within Europe. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's a very good example of a peace system. Iroquois did the same thing. Upper Zingu people from Brazil did the same thing. 
various other cases of peace systems can accomplish this. So that's really, it, it's an exciting line of research to try to figure out what, what a peace system is, how it came into being, and what really promotes it and maintains it. So that's what we're really trying to do here. And these are some of the initial thoughts that I think make a lot of sense to, that can contribute to peace. And, and you know, you, you commented on interdependence. I just really want to highlight that. You know, you can have, if you picture by analogy, 16 people in a life raft in the middle of the ocean. And you can look off of the distance and see land. If you all start paddling towards the land, well, you're probably going to get there. But if 16 different people just either sit there and do nothing, or some of them start trying to paddle this way on the boat, and the others start paddling the other way, the boat's going to go in circles, and the land is going to be not found, right? So, you know, it's an analogy. But this is really where I see us with this really, really critical problem of, of, of climate change and, and, and global warming. We, we just have to paddle together on this one. It, it's a huge uniting factor. So we can't simultaneously accept the institution of war and allow that to continue and put our resources into more and more munitions and armaments and, and bombs and weapons at the same time that we, we are paddling together. So this, this may be, as I think you, you honed right in on, this interdependence might be really a critical factor so if you're looking down at the life raft, you, you can see everybody needs to paddle together. The difficulty here, I think, is one an understanding gap. And we might be just at the point where enough people and enough leaders truly do understand this, that we don't have any more time to waste with this type of old narrative of, well, we must develop armaments in case they attack us. You know, we've got to paddle together on this one. Okay, great. So let's end on that note because we've been going through, uh, we've already went over 90 minutes or something like that. So, uh, it flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So before we go, uh, I mean, you've been mentioning a lot of different papers during the interview, and if you could send me some references via email later, just for me to put in the description box of the interview, because I guess that would be very useful for the audience. But would you like to make reference to any, for example, websites or some places on the internet where people can more easily have access to your work? Well, yes, I, I mean, an, an easy source. I, I've just changed universities, as we talked about a little bit, and therefore the current website is not really up and running to the extent I'd like it to be at the moment, so my apologies for that. A, a good alternative would be simply to go to Amazon.com, and I have an author's page, which I have updated, and it does list the, the various books from Nurturing Our Humanities to Human Potential for Peace, or Peace and Human Nature, these, these types of books that I've been talking about and drawing material from. So that's a good source for the books. And I'll certainly send you some, um, some of the articles, titles, and so forth as well, just to make it easy for people. Um, it, we talked quite a lot about restraint. So I would highlight a chapter in that book by uh, Anna Zala and myself about restraint. Mm -hmm. So if someone would like to look at that one in particular, that's in War, Peace, and Human Nature, Chapter 23. Yeah, but I'll, I'll send you some links. Thank you for the invitation for that. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to talk with you. I, I really hope that we can move humanity towards understanding we can cooperate and we can solve these major problems because I think that's really the most important uh, question or real world application to this type of human nature or peace and human nature perspective. So thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. No, it was absolutely my pleasure. And I, I will be leaving links to all of what you've just said in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. I read a lot of that material. And uh, Douglas, it was really a pleasure again to have you on the show. So thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you so much. 
Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar or PayPal. And please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Kondriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Illy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, and my three producers, Cesar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.